Okay, so <clears throat> now let me introduce uh, our keynote speaker, our first keynote speaker of, of the meeting, uh, who is George Church. He is professor of genetics at Harvard uh, Medical School, and he will be known to all of you for his pioneering work in genomics and many, many other technologies and fields that he has founded. He was the first to come up with a technology that allowed genomic sequencing. He then automated the process in many different ways. He went into synthetic biology and he has been reading, writing genomes for a long time. Uh, he is the director of the Personal Genomes Project in the US, which he has been running for at least six years now with a great success. And more recently, he, he has pioneered methods that allow modifying, editing genomes and epigenomes. And that's what he will be talking to us about today. It is uh, about new technologies for sequencing, interpreting, and altering epigenomes. And uh, we are extremely lucky and grateful for George to, to have come to this meeting because I know he took two red-eye flights in a row to be here. Uh, and, and so please welcome very warmly George Church for his keynote lecture. Thank you very much, Stefan. I've, I've known Stefan for a very, very long time, and we just uh, yesterday launched the Personal Genome Project in the UK, and that was a very uh, exciting moment for both of us. Uh, I'm not going to abuse the full hour and five minutes that I have allotted here. I think you'd prefer to talk to each other, so I will encourage discussion at the end of, of this, and so start queuing up your questions. I will try to be very clear, uh, but if you are confused, it's almost certain that everybody around you is, so please ask questions uh, at the end. Uh, this is my conflict of interest slide. Um, and, <laughs> uh, many of you have seen it before. It gets uh, more complex every now and then. Um, and I am talking about new technologies. Uh, I, hopefully, I mean, the, the two that I'll talk about you actually haven't, uh, haven't been published. But it's in the context of what I think we really need uh, going forward with, for common diseases. And some of these things go without saying, but, I'll, but they really need to be put in this context, which is we need quality. Uh, we need haplotypes and, and inversions and translocations. And exome typically does not deliver these. Uh, so as an example of quality, not to pick on exomes or anything. We need to be able to understand epigenomics at the multicellular and subcellular level. And that means it's not single, single cell anymore. And so I will describe a method uh, called FISIC or fluorescent in situ sequencing, which is compatible with either normal resolution or super resolution 3D microscopy. We need to be able not only to read the epigenome, but we need to, need to be able to alter it. And uh, CRISPR is one of the methods I will emphasize in that uh, respect. And as uh, Stefan and I have mentioned, this Personal Genome Project is a truly unique resource for human epigenomics, at least, because it gives not only access to precision medicine, but to cell lines and uh, methodologies uh, that are quite interesting in the context of these organoids on chips, which is what I'll end on. So we need to go from correlation to causation. This is not just about big cohorts. You can do cohorts of n equal 1 if you have causation on your side. It's not just about linkage, as we see in common variants, but really full genomes and epigenomes. Uh, we want actual haplotypes, and again, I, I can't emphasize too much the ability to get to inversions and translocations. And finally, environmental factors and their impact on the epigenome, and these include microbiome, our immune response to it, to food, and so forth. I do this just to get you oriented. I know you all know this, but uh, we went from a $3 billion genome to an affordable one. Uh, we were concerned that as the Genome Project ended and there was essentially no market, uh, I, uh, and there's still really no market, uh, that it would flatline. It did not flatline. It, was, uh, it didn't even follow the optimistic exponential of the Moore's Law for Electronics, which would have predicted six decades from 2004 until an affordable genome, but it arrived in six years. And it's, uh, it's a little less than $1,000 uh, cost. The price is still uh, $5,000, but the cost is, is, is much lower than that. And, and it's not just an exponential improvement in cost, it's an exponential improvement in quality, and both exponentials have 
change their slope in a favorable way, um, meaning they're both faster than Moore's law. And so, for example, the, the, the SNP error rate now with the LFR and, and pr probably other uh, related dilution methods can get not only to 10 to the minus 7th, but, but closer to 10 to the minus 9th now, uh, that's unpublished, uh, meaning about one error per genome in terms of false positives in the well-behaved parts of the genome, which is most of it. And the haplotype phase length has increased uh, dramatically. The most recent one is our uh, characterization of PGP uh, bacterial artificial chromosomes, which is a synthetic biology resource, but it also allowed us to set uh, haplotype phase uh, length of N50 around uh, 3 million. That was uh, Kun Zhang at UCSD, uh, who we collaborate on that. Now, the context for the in situ sequencing, which I'm getting to rapidly, is this is why we started next gen sequencing in the first place. We called it fluorescent in situ sequencing in 1999, and that was Rob Mitra, uh, graduate student and a postdoc, and then Jay Shindor, a graduate student and a postdoc, uh, and they're now professors at WashU and UWash, respectively. And then Roddy Dramatic has been a tremendous collaborator for many, many years, um, and, and this Sequencing by ligation is the main method, the method used at complete genomics. And you can see it's an ordered array. It's not a, a random array. And they're ordered in these DNA nanoballs in a, in a grid. The position here doesn't really matter. It's nice that it's on a grid, but I'm going to talk to you about a method where the position of the, of the individual sequence reads matters. But the important thing is each of these dots builds up over cycles of next-gen sequencing a long tag, and it doesn't have to be that much longer than 20 in order to be a unique tag in a genome or a transcriptome. You can get at, at this high accuracy, both SNP and haplotype accuracy, by diluting uh, your genomic fragments into a 384-well plate or some other dilution method, and uh, this allows you to tell whether you have uh, two mutations on one strand or on two, uh, but in just in general, it's good to have phase. So what about this multicellular, subcellular method, this physique? It starts with uh, tissue, uh, either cells or, 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 or slices, uh, and the, it, it, it's fixed and initially can be fixed with formalin, but ultimately it's fixed with this special cross-linking agent, this uh, polyethylene glycol bis-succimidyl uh, ester, and this will hit any primary amine meaning the proteins. We leave the proteins in place. They're a bit of a nuisance in certain ways, but they're a big advantage in others, as you'll see. Uh, it, so it allows us to, to probe both the RNA and the protein in principle with antibodies and nucleic acid probes. But this is not fish. This is uh, sequencing. So we make uh, cDNA and circularize that. So we have small circular uh, cDNAs and then uh, do very light uh, isothermal amplification so that each position that there was an RNA or DNA molecule initially is now a dot, and that's, that can be sequenced the same way as, this, as the next-gen sequencing I showed you from complete genomics, except now the three dimension, it's three-dimensional rather than two, and the XYZ coordinates actually matter now because they, re, they correspond to the XYZ coordinates of RNA. I'll, sh I'll show you some pictures in just a moment, but first I want to show you <clears throat> the kind of uh, data that we're getting. This is a, a pie chart of the representation in fibroblasts, which is where we've done most of our uh, uh, technology development. These are, of course, PGP uh, fibroblasts from Personal Genome Project. And you can see on the left half is mostly ribosomal RNAs. Um, that's actually a fairly small representation. This is random primed RNA sequencing, you can think of it. And, uh, and we compare the same cells with conventional RNA sequencing and this in situ sequencing. And so we think that the ribosomal RNAs and a few other uh, housekeeping genes are underrepresented, which is fine because most people aren't that interested in them, but, but all of the, uh, the uh, cell type specific ones are, are well represented. We've, we've done uh, about, in this experiment, 13,000 reads from 40 fibroblast cells, uh, getting about 2,700 genes detected. The per, per base error is Actually, it's 1% over the whole read, and it's 0.07%. That's, that's a single read per, uh, for the first 22 bases, which is where most of the information is. So it's really quite accurate, and we can use any next-gen fluorescent method. This happened to be done with the sequencing by ligation. Um, 
similar to what the solid device uses in the complete genomics device. This is, show, this is a validation by comparing it directly to RNA sequencing. This is so RNA sequencing on a, on a homogeneous fibroblast culture versus individual subcellular RNAs. And this, this is the correlation coefficient along the y-axis. Um, and then as a function of the number of times we observe a read. So the more times we observe a read, the more likely it's going to be uh, accurate and biologically reproducible. And you can see there's good correlation with a variety of different cell types because uh, there's certain uh, transcripts that just are abundant in or, un or low abundance in, in all cell types. But you can see the fibroblasts correlate best with fibroblasts and, and worse with the induced pluripotent stem cells derived from those fibroblasts. These are all isogenic from the same person, me, actually. Um, and then uh, this, is, uh, this is one messenger RNA chosen because it's a rather large messenger RNA to give you a feeling for how many of the reads uh, on this in situ sequencing uh, are, rep are represented along the RNA. And you can see there's very few nucleotides that are not represented at all. In particular, the, one, the biggest block that's missing is, uh, is an exon, EDB, e, e, EDB, which is um, known to be missing from this particular cell type for this messenger RNA fibronectin. So this, there's 8,800 <coughs> 8, uh, nucleotide long messenger. And that, so that exon is, is missing as we expected. And then the other one, EDA, is present. And so we've detected alternative splicing, and we've also detected this uh, synonymous uh, uh, G to A uh, polymorphism. So you can, in principle, you, since it's real sequencing, you, could, you can detect things that you didn't expect. You can see RNA editing. You can see allele-specific expression and so forth. So again, we're doing this by counting uh, individual messenger RNAs in the cell, and we can find uh, distribution is quite often asymmetric within the cell. We've tried this out at, uh, on quite a number of different uh, organisms and cell types. Here's uh, mouse brain and embryos. Uh, I've already shown you human fibroblast, induced pluripotent stem cells, Drosophila, embryos, and so on. It, it seems to work in every tissue sep sample that we've tried, which uh, was surprising to me anyway. Now, you may have uh, done the calculation in your head, the, the density of RNAs is quite, uh, quite high. It's about one every 100 nanometers or so, depending on the cell type. And so that we have three ways of, of, of getting at all of the RNAs. We're not yet at all the RNAs, but as we get closer to all of the RNAs per cell, uh, we need to resolve the crowdedness. And in fact, we've d backed off from how many, how many we could get for some of the we've done intentionally. So there are three methods. Deconvolution I won't show you because that's sort of conventional uh, computational methodology. I will show you the, la the second two. Um, molecular stratification is, a uh, is, is simple in concept, which is you can have cDNAs that are, uh, that where the primers can be um, uh, stratified, so you're only looking at a subset of cDNAs, cDNAs that say, um, are randomly primed or, in, or have an A at the three prime end of the primer or have an AC. And you can, roughly speaking, you expect that to be one quarter and one sixteenth. And you can see that as we change those primers, the, the, the density goes down and the clarity uh, and, uh, and uh, quality goes up in that far right uh, panel. Now, you might say, well, I'm not willing to give up one sixteenth of my messenger RNAs, but you don't have to because these, this cross-linking, this peg cross-linking basically makes a peg hydrogel of your thick sections or cells, and it's like, it's, it's like a very uh, sturdy uh, a plastic uh, hydrogel. And so you can go over, over and over. You can do this, the next-gen cycles, and you can go through and do them again with a different primer set. Um, and you can relocate every, every pixel uh, to, to, sub, uh, to, to, uh, to the resolution of the microscope. So anyway, so you can go back and you can do this 16 times. We haven't done that yet, but that's uh, feasible. So the third method for uh, enhancing the resolution so that we can get at the, at the uh, high-density transcripts and this has a, uh, this, there are a variety of physics-based methods uh, that depend on flickering of uh, fluorophores. 
Typically, you'll have a, a, a labile fluorophore of some sort that, that flickers on and off. And, uh, and this has been uh, uh, <clears throat> championed by uh, uh, physical chemists like Xiaowei Zhuang, uh, who's a, in, in, our, in our chemistry department. But this is a little different in that now the flickering is caused by uh, the hybridization of a, a short oligonucleotide. And as it comes on and off in rapid equilibrium, just do, which you can titrate by the length of the oligonucleotide, the fluorescent oligonucleotide causes flickering, and we can capture that. And this is a kind of a calibration experiment that we did in, in collaboration with uh, uh, William Shi and Peng Yin's lab. Uh, all of us are in the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard. And we made these DNA nanostructures with, with barcodes that, that are, which are potentially useful in and of themselves as a way of getting multiplexing. And the distance between the, the different colors uh, is as small as 42 nanometers here, and they're very easily resolved. Um, and so uh, if you, have, you might have some interest in these as, as barcodes, but in this case, I'm just using an illustration of the super resolution that you can achieve by f uh, flickering um, oligonucleotide binding. And I should, I should mention most of what we've done in my lab is, is based on looking at RNA in, the, sort of the, uh, in that, uh, uh, that assay for the epigenome. But, uh, but my wife, Ting Wu, uh, and her lab has, has published this paper in PNAS that I urge you to take a look at on uh, what she calls oligopaints for chromosomes. So you can do the same thing I've been talking about in, in C2 uh, with rich... Uh, uh, resolution, she's done uh, super resolution as well, where you can, you can march along the chromosome with oligonu synthetic oligonucleotides. Mil she, she can make millions of synthetic oligonucleotides very inexpensively on chips, and then, um, and then you can um, basically map the, the, the chromosomes and you can correlate that to other uh, epigenomics on a normal resolution or super resolution scale. So I urge you to take a look at that. Uh, an ass paper. So, but now we, we have a new method, uh, a couple of new methods to do, uh, to look at the epigenome, to observe it, but we want to be able to alter it, and that's what, uh, what I'll tell you about CRISPR. Now, we want to alter it not just to test hypotheses and to, and to refine our observations, but we also want to uh, 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 change the genome and the epigenome for therapeutic reasons. And kind of the cutting edge of this, no pun intended, is, uh, I just thought of that, uh, is, uh, is this uh, clinical trial, phase two clinical trial from Sangamo, um, where uh, engineered, uh, sort of almost semi-de novo, eight fingers, where, where two pairs of four fingers are required to bring together this heterodimeric bacterial nuclease, so this, uh, these fusion proteins, and only if all eight fingers bind do you get a double-strand break in the CCR5 gene, and hence um, you get a double null with a, a reasonable frequency. It, it, it's it's uh, just efficient enough that you do occasionally get double nulls, and those double null T-cells T are no longer uh, sensitive to the HIV-1 um, AIDS virus. And so this is, as I said, in phase two clinical trials. Now that's, we'd like it to be more efficient. We'd like it to be much easier to program zinc fingers are not the easiest things in the world to program. So my, my group and others have explored seven different ways of doing targeting. Uh, I'm just gonna mention CRISPR since it's the newest and we think the best, the most general, it applies in many organisms. We also like, so they're, they're either based on, the, on a short oligonucleotide doing the searching through the genome uh, either DNA or RNA, or sometimes the protein itself does the recognition and you need to have a protein code, and that's what the previous slide on the zinc finger nucleases and the talons that we and others have published a bit about. But with CRISPR, uh, it's RNA that's doing the recognition aided by a protein called Cas9, and it makes essentially a triple helix, and it cleaves on both strands, both the, the RNA-DNA hybrid strand and the other strand with two different nuclease domains, which we can knock out independently if we want. Now this CRISPR has a long, a long story. It, it, it's, it started in 1987 with an observation by Ishuno et al. and uh, E. coli, and it, it fell into the category of stuff that we weren't supposed to be sequencing in the Genome Project, which is junk DNA. These were not conserved, uh, and, they were, uh, <coughs> and they were repetitive, and so, uh, so why would anyone be interested in them? But with time, they eventually became, became clear they became 
clear that it was part of the bacterial adaptive immunity. And then uh, in January, um, we and Jennifer Doudna and Feng Zhang and others uh, applied them to human cells as a technology. So they were first developed in human cells, ironically, and then they were distributed um, to all the model organisms and, and numerous non-model organisms. So mouse, zebrafish, Arabidopsis, uh, Drosophila, C. elegans, yeast, some of your favorite organisms, and more. Um, and it's not just about cleavage, uh, but it's also about uh, epigenomic modification, which you'll see in a moment. Now, for cleavage, there's two routes. One is the non-homologous injoining, the other is homologous recombination. This is one of our first experiments on homologous recombinations, and I just want to show that's the, those are the uh, Prashant Mali, who was a postdoc, Luhan Yang was a student, now a postdoc, uh, and they were co-first authors on this. And they engineered this to target two sites right next to each other and which overlap a talon site because we were quite uh, <coughs> enthusiastic about talons up until this till we found CRISPR, Cas9. And here's an example of an experiment that made us revise our opinion, uh, and, and it's not over yet, but uh, there's uh, the orange lines show the difference between the, the talon homologous recombination and the Cas9, which is about 9 to 22-fold uh, uh, change. And so, uh, but more importantly than the efficiency is it's a lot easier to, to test lots of these uh, guide RNAs. You simply have to make a 20 mer or 30 mer or something that you fix it into your vector, and, that, and it follows simple Watson-Crick. It doesn't involve uh, protein code, uh, where you have to make a 2 kb protein in the case of talons. Now, it, we're not limited to, to point mutations or homologous recombination. We can also make very large deletions. And here, postdoc Susan Byrne um, did this uh, experiment on the human thigh one locus, where she anchored either of two left end guide RNAs. So there's going to be pairs of guide RNAs at different distances. So you anchor the left end and then make various right ends. And showing both left ends and all the right ends, you, can get, you get a fairly flat distribution around 10% efficiency um, from 3 to 83 kb. There's a, a dip at 40 kb that we haven't characterized. It could be that it's a sequencing error. It could be that it's a chromatin structure that is resistant. But our experience overall has been that once we hunt these things down, there, there's essentially no place uh, other than possibly this one that, that is resistant to uh, the Cas9 structures, in contrast to the talons, which are, we routinely find places that are very, very hard uh, or uh, so far impossible to target. Okay, so um, you can not only make uh, point mutations, uh, you know, short oligonucleotide uh, mediated, but uh, uh, non-homologous injoining and, and big deletions. We can do replacements. And here we've got two, two cutting sites again, but this time we've, we're putting in a donor DNA where we're replacing the human thigh one with the mouse thigh one gene. And you can see uh, these are fact sorted. Thigh one's particularly nice because there's great immunological reagents for both uh, the uh, human and mouse forms. And so you can see in all the panels except uh, the, 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 um, the one with the orange arrow, which is having both left and right guide RNAs, so getting cleavage on both sides. If you just cleave on the left or the right or no, no cleavage, you get about 0.1 to 0.6%, but then if you cleave on both sides, it's about, uh, it's a little over 16% efficiency. And this, I should mention, these are efficiencies without any selection. Um, so they're, they're really quite efficient. We decided that we were not satisfied with just one Cas9 protein. You might say that we should be, uh, but um, the reason is, uh, there are many reasons, there are four reasons at least. One is that the protein itself confers some of the specificity. There's a dinucleotide, a GG dinucleotide, that confers part of the specificity. The rest of it is the, is the RNA, which we vary. And so basically, computationally, you have to search for GG, and then you design the RNA. We'd prefer to be able to target any nucleotide in the genome, and so we're looking for new, these are called PAM specificities, doesn't matter what the acronym is, but it's the protein part of it. And, it, and we wanted something beyond GG, ideally uh, all possible dinucleotides. Um, we wanted smaller proteins for adenosociated virus uh, delivery for gene therapy and so forth. Maybe specificity improvement, not critical, because we have other methods that I'll mention in a moment. 
And we'd like to be able to have orthogonal functions going on in the same cell so we can have different sets of guide RNAs doing different things. They could be cutting, nicking, um, activating and repressing, uh, and chromosome folding, and we'll see that in a moment. So this Kevin Esfeld is a, a fellow at the Wies Institute, and, uh, and he championed this, uh, this search through essentially uh, a metagenomic search for homologs of the Cas9 and other organisms. Most of these are fairly nasty pathogens, except for the uh, strep thermophilus, which is part of the yogurt process. But the point is they're well-studied organisms. And here is uh, the guide RNA, uh, sorry, the, 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 the orthogonal, you got guide RNA on one axis and the Cas9 protein that recognizes on the other. And you can see there's very little crosstalk. Only the diagonals of this matrix are, are lighting up. And you can see that the protein part of it are not GG anymore. They're, they're four independent specificities. Not, they're not easily defined, but they're on the order of dinucleotide specificity. Um, and we hope to get complete freedom from uh, protein constraints so that we can dial up any sequence we want in the genome. We're not quite there yet. So this is from a, a paper that uh, Kevin and uh, Prashant wrote uh, recently in Nature Methods, and it's a nice overview and future-looking. Future uh, and so it describes uh, how we can make epigenetic modifications uh, either activation or repression uh, by putting on those, those, um, those modules, those protein modules, either onto the Cas9 protein, so making a protein fusion, or we can put it uh, via an RNA binding uh, domain, we can attach it to the guide RNA, whichever uh, achieves the goals of the orthogonal experiments if you wanted to have multiple ones going on. So you can target any place in the genome without changing the genome, and that, this is really quite, quite interesting. And, the, and, and then the final uh, diagram in the lower right is how we can uh, tag to, uh, uh, couple two guide RNAs together in order to make two uh, Cas9s that will bind and, and um, in some cases may alter chromosome folding or chromosome pairing. So uh, to the extent that the, that the still only very, we're just beginning uh, to understand what the rules are for chromosome folding, and we'd like to be able to test them as well as uh, observe them. So we want precise engineering. It's more important for, say, human gene therapy than it is for most of our experimental work, but we still, we get, we're obsessive and we, we like to make these things. So we have five methods. The first one is two, which is we computationally look for unique sites, in other words, a, a 14 mer to 20 mer that is unique in the genome, um, that's computational. Then among those unique ones, we can, because they're so inexpensive, we can synthesize hundreds of thousands of them, and we can do empirical searches to show that the ones that are uh, computationally unique are also, um, have very little off-target empirically and are very efficient empirically, if there's any, and there is a, a small range in, in efficiency. We can use NICs rather than double-strand breaks. NICs tend to work, get, favor homologous recombination over non-homologous enjoining, and we can require two or more sites for cleavage or up to 10 sites or so for activation uh, of the uh, transcription. So here's an example of that, of that requiring coincidence. If you have an off-target site, you do your best to reduce the off-target site computationally and empirically, but then if you have one, it has a probability uh, of being there, and if you have a but if you have an on-site where it requires two events or 10 events, then the probability you have those two right next to each other uh, off-target are very small, you know, p squared or p to the n power. So here's an example where we have 10 sites, uh, that's, that's the promoter uh, diagram there for Rex1 uh, messenger RNA, and the little gold arrows are pl places we targeted with the Cas9 guide RNAs, and you can see you get low levels of, of activation with them individually, but when you put them together, uh, five or ten at a time, you get um, up to 30-fold activation, so 30-fold activation. Um, and so the probability that they would be together randomly off-target is very low. And this is from uh, Prashant's uh, and uh, at all uh, this year. All of this is this year. Now, John Ock is kind of co-runs my, my lab and my uh, center of excellence uh, and uh, grant from the NIH. 
and, and he designed in January uh, a, a collection of, that targets 90% of the genes in the human genome, and for each gene, 40% of the exons in that gene. And, uh, and so that, that was 190,000 guide RNAs, and, he, and he's doing it again, um, uh, targeting uh, regulatory um, uh, regions so that you can either uh, so it's kind of like an RNAi library, except RNAi typically has trouble going down more than a five-fold or ten-fold suppression, but guide RNAs can take it down to zero by making double nulls, and it can also take it up by the activation method I just mentioned. So it has a, a brighter, broader range, both positive and negative. So we're targeting uh, messenger RNAs, long non-coding RNAs, and microRNAs, uh, both for uh, up and down. And uh, so before I go into the, the uses of that uh, further, um, I just want to introduce this personal genome project because it is the synthetic biology method of choice for humans, I think, as well as, uh, as other uh, analytic components. So, uh, you know, it's intended to connect genomes, environments, and traits via epigenetics. Uh, the environmental components can be measured. Um, there's a million-fold reduction in the cost of the inherited genome, but there's also a million-fold, roughly, drop in cost for the microbiome, the immunome, and the epigenetic uh, response to chemicals, nutrition, and so on. So we're beginning to work with the ENCODE project, which I'm sure all of you know about, uh, because they want to have properly consented cell lines and uh, access to the kind of uh, CRISPR transdifferentiation that we're doing. Uh, so that's a wonderful, we're just beginning on that, and that I'm having a, a great time um, doing that. And we're also working with uh, Genomes in a Bottle, which is a genomes, world genome standard, which uses the Personal Genome Project. Now, why is it special? It's the, it's the world's only open access data sets for genomes, environments, and traits for humans, as far as I know. I'd be happy to hear otherwise. Uh, and it provides these cells, uh, which can be reprogrammed. Here are the PGP-1 cells that have been reprogrammed into uh, uh, all, essentially every tissue in the body using the teratoma model uh, on the left or uh, some in vitro uh, culture, on, uh, organ culture on the right, and uh, more about that in a moment. But we also do kind of high-level phenotyping of the same individual for the same cells, so they're not just anonymous cells. You know that that's the, the fMRI uh, slices through the brain, fortunately, um, virtual slices rather, actual slices since that's my brain. Um, and we are interested in correlation, uh, so, sorry, causality, uh, because there are many mutations which are unique uh, in the population so far, at least there's only one individual characterized. For example, myostatin, I believe there's one individual's double null for that and one that's double null for the receptor, but one way of testing causality with animal models, and here is uh, an interesting case of three different animal models for this, and it's fairly convincing that these all have enhanced muscle growth and decreased atherosclerosis. So that's interesting not only because of the causality, the N equals one, but also that it's a protective allele. Now to get a causality in humans, and there are reasons why you would do it in, in human rather than, um, than uh, animals. You have these organoids, or organs on chip, I'll show you some examples of each, um, where you can make various different tissues um, from, from fibroblasts to iPS cells to these different tissues. And here's an example, uh, not from my lab, but from uh, Lancaster et al. in the recent Nature, emphasizing how uh, mouse is not always the ideal model. Uh, it's not ideal for cardiac, for, for cancer, and in this case for, uh, for brain. They're trying to model micro <clears throat> microcephaly and uh, the, the particular anatomical structures of the inner fiber layer and the outer subventricular zone are completely absent. And when you introduce the, the correct mutant alleles from human into mouse, they don't have the phenotype possibly related to that. So for example, for CDK5 RAP2, which is thought to be the causative, uh, uh, the, the alleles in that are thought to be causative for this. Um, this particular type of microcephaly. And here you can see how well-ordered these um, uh, cerebral organoids are. S they're so well-ordered that you can actually uh, tell the difference between the uh, common allele and this, this uh, rare mutant allele 
in the bl blue as being the control and the green being the mutant, in terms of the, the angle of the radial glial cells as they, as they uh, get oriented is random uh, for the, the patient-derived uh, iPS cells. Now, this, did, this experiment was not done wh where the sh they proved the causality of that particular allele by introducing that allele into the control cells. This is just control versus patient cells, uh, reprogrammed, admittedly, but not genetically changed. To genetically change them, we've, we've done a similar experiment, but with the Cas9. You've already seen that there are two pathways. You can take non-homologous injoining or homologous recombination based on the guide RNA finding the right place in the genome. Um, and then we used not the organoids, but organs on chips, which uh, the organoids are kind of uh, in, in a, on a plate, but this is, has a, um, these various tissues, uh, and this is work from uh, the Wyss Institute, where I'm a member, and Don Ingber and Kit Parker have uh, developed this, where you have mechanical structures where things flex, like the lungs, uh, the lungs on chip expand with, with air, and the heart, the cardiac contracts. And so we have the cardiac mop model for this. And, uh, and these are uh, Barth syndrome patients. They have a cardiomyopathy um, that uh, uh, affects the uh, mitochondria and it's due to mutations in the TAS gene. But to show causality, um, we took a control line. This is PGP1 again. That's, that's my uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. And we used a DOCS-inducible um, Cas9 protein and a piggyback uh, excisable, uh, and uh, then guide RNA introduced, and then you can make either uh, a control where you, where you don't have any guide RNA, it's just the piggyback, and so we'll, that's basically un, unchanged uh, genome. And then in the middle is, uh, is uh, the exact single base uh, guanine deletion, and then non-homologous injoining is kind of making a mess in that same region, and, you'll, and you can see there that uh, on the top is the normal sequence, and then just below it is missing one G, and then below that is missing uh, three Gs and putting in other bases, which is what non-homologous injoining does. So we've got these three alleles, clean background, all isogenic, and then you can do uh, four functional assays, and I won't spend a lot of time on each because you get the idea, is that uh, you can rescue these with, uh, with the messenger RNA called, it's a modified messenger RNA here, uh, so it gets into the cells easily. Um, and if you, and so you have the, the three different uh, cell types, all modifications of the PGP control, where there's essentially no change, the correct single base change, and then a, a, a mess, the you know, non-homologous injoining, and uh, they cannot be rescued. The ones that are, the two that are broken can't be rescued um, by GFP, but they can be rescued by the TAS messenger RNA. And then we have assays for respiratory capacity and assays for contractile capacity. Here you can see these little leaflets of PDMS. They attach uh, the myofibrils in a very ordered way. This, remember, this came from essentially uh, fibroblasts from my skin. These are highly ordered uh, anatomically, and then they contract. Um, here you can see uh, this is what we artistically call di diastole and systole, and you can see the big change in normal tissue, and you don't see that with a mutant. And here is a, a better view of the anatomy, not the contraction, um, where you can see both the uh, Barth uh, mutant, single point mutation introduced uh, by Cas9, and the non-homologous injoining, and then how they can be rescued with the modified messenger RNA. So that's, so those are uh, um, uh, cardiac muscle. These are neurons we can make. And this is a protocol where, where we can do this in, in just four days. This is, um, this is less than even occurs in vivo. In vivo, this process would take about 80 days. Um, and in vitro, it's taken about that long until now. But, but you can show you can skip several steps and make these uh, bipolar neurons with about 98% yield, meaning there's no embryonic stem cells left at the end. And there's all these, um, these very distinctive bipolar neurons. This is doxycycline inducible again. Um, and this is the work of Patrick Guy and uh, Volker Buskopf and others. And you can get uh, electrophysiological recording, and we have uh, 
We have uh, neurons that, that are very uh, immature and mature in terms of synapse formation and, um, and electrophysiology. We uh, can do um, RNA-seq. We have not yet done Physseq on these, and that's one of the pities here, uh, actually, is that when we do RNA-seq, we can do this kind of cellular pathway, uh, just so story, you know, with blue and red going up and down. But the important thing is it's very hard to identify what cell this corresponds in a developing organism because there are very few databases of messenger RNAs from individual cells. Um, and so if you take a chunk of brain, you're getting a mixture of neurons and glia and, uh, and blood cells um, unless you're... And so we, we, we need that, uh, and hopefully we'll get it from the fluorescent in situ sequencing. So I've left plenty of time for discussion. Um, I'm sure I've said some things a little too quickly. Um, but this is what we're, we're, t we're talking about, this, this quality that we, that we want for uh, genome sequencing and epigenome observations. We'd like to be able to do it at, at uh, in situ, at, in three-dimensional, um, and we're, as part of our brain initiative, we're trying to do this through serial sections um, and capturing uh, activity of the brain as well, using in situ sequencing. It's a, a multi-purpose thing there. And then uh, we'd like to be able to not only um, read but also write uh, to control the epigenome and chromosome folding. Um, and CRISPR, we think, is one tool that can be added to many other uh, valuable tools. And then if you're interested in cell lines uh, or if you're interested in participating in the Personal Genome Project, it's now present. It's available in a number of different countries. But if you want the cell lines, uh, they're, they're freely available um, either from Coriel uh, or from, from our group. Um, and the Cas9 system is available from AdGene, which is a nonprofit that just distributes plasmas, some of you may know. Um, and then this Organs on Chip is not quite ready for prime time. We, it's hard to manufacture these PDMS chips, but uh, you get the, they will be soon. And it's just I'm thankful to the, to the many people I've mentioned uh, along the way, but also in a meta sense for the Personal Genome Project volunteers and, uh, and the staff. Thank you very much. I have two questions. The first one is uh, with the virus disease, the TAS mutations. Uh, what is the, I guess, do you have to have 100% of the cells mutated, you get that phenotype, or a chimerism, you know, only say 70 or 50% of the cells mutated, you'll get that? Uh -huh. Cardiac phenotype. Right. So um, we haven't really tested how much chimerism would, would give us a well ordered array. What we typically do is we have a pipeline that produces clonal IPS and then we differ so that, so that it's 100% so at that point. The efficiency is for the IPS, it depends on the construct, but it's, it's on the order of uh, 10 to up to 60, 70% without selection. But nevertheless, we typically clone them and then differentiate them. Okay. So the second question is uh, with regards to CRISPR and Talon. So I guess since Talon targets the genome, so if you have modifications in the genome, for example, cytosine methylations, yeah. or then that will interfere with the recognition, right? Do you do you think how much of the contribution was that to the inefficiency of Talon? Yes, I've I've, I've heard that myself. We haven't tested that, but. But the, the talons act by recognizing the major groove of the double-stranded DNA, and that's exactly where the methylation of the C is. The, the guide RNAs for the CRISPR bind to the, on the Watson-Crick face of the, of the DNA, and, it's, and it, it's theoretically and also empirically insensitive to methylation as far as we can tell. Um, and in fact, it seems to be insensitive to sequence, except for that one example that I showed you, uh, which we haven't. Uh, looked into yet. Just a comment for the students in the room, if you're trying to decide what you want to do when you grow up, um, well, you can actually do um, everything really well, if, but you just have to be George. <laughs> 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 um, but with that comment in mind, so He's just I trying to ask, throw me off here. Yeah, <laughs> well, you do this to me. So, um, you know, I get asked this question by people who, like, run my medical school or university uh, all the time, which is, 
uh, how soon are we going to be ready to do uh, particularly engineered tissues in a practical way? Are we talking about a couple years, five years, ten years? But in the case like you have your own organs on a chip, like say one of these things starts to deteriorate in you, George. Um, and, and you know what the mutation is, and you want to try and engineer that uh, from, uh, from these re-engineered IPS and go ahead and, um, and put that in. Um, to, from a scientific and technical point, ignoring all regulatory issues, all of them, but how, how far away, what do you think? I mean, you really do see the big picture. What do you think? Well, you know, I, I don't think we need to ignore the regulatory. It's, part, it's actually part of the fun from my standpoint, is, is dealing with, with safety. Uh, the FDA is not really much of a block if, if you have something that's highly effective and, and safe, and we can do that now. Um, how far away? I mean, these, are, these organs on chips are very small, but they're extremely accurate uh, for, the, for the scale that they're trying, both for, for, the, for the brain, for the cardiac. We have gut on chip that, that is, tolerates bacteria. Normally, you don't put bacteria into tissue culture, but these things coexist happily, as they do in our gut. Uh, the lungs have epithelial support layer, endothelial with blood and air, and they go in and out with the air. But this is not a transplantable kidney. Um, there, you know, there's basically three approaches of 3D printing. There's a developmental biology, which is what we're using, uh, and then there's uh, self-assembly independent of developmental biology, which Prashant, Molly, the same as the CRISPR, we published a paper on that. I, I would bet on the developmental biology, and I would bet that it's very soon. It's within the next couple of years that we can go from the small organoids to, to organs. But the key thing is vascularization. You need to get these things vascularized early in the process and pump in blood or blood substitutes, or else they will necrose because they don't have adequate uh, flow of, of uh, input and output. But I, I think it's very close, I mean, really. I had two questions as well, and the first one displays my ignorance, but I didn't understand what you meant when you said CRISPR can be used to make epigenomic mutations, epigenomic changes. What exactly do you mean by that? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm using epigenomics maybe more broadly than, than everybody here does, I don't, I don't know, uh, but uh, meaning that you can uh, make a double null in the, in the two nicking enzyme domains, so now it is a binding protein. I forgot to mention that, actually, a key point. Uh, so it, it, it simply binds to whatever sequence you dial up, and literally you can dial up hundreds of thousands of sequences because we make these guide RNAs, the DNAs for the guide RNAs on chips. So, you can, so we have made hundreds of thousands. Um, and then you can, you can target however many you want to however many genes you want so they can have activation domains or repression domains, either at the transcriptional level, at the chromatin modification level, uh, and you can use your imagination. As far as I know, not just our lab, but other labs, everything they've tried, every domain they've tried to introduce has worked. Okay, and my second question was about the sequencing at the beginning. With this um, diagram you had of the percentage of RNA types, yeah. and you had only 5% of non-coding RNAs. Is that because there are only 5% of non-coding RNAs, or is your method not able to access nuclear RNAs? Uh, no, well, so um, let's right get that one up yes. here. Yes, this one. So this is comparable to uh, our, our impression is, and I'd have to go back and check this, but our impression is except for the housekeeping genes, there's a slight enrichment for all the non-housekeeping genes. Uh, not artifactually so, but somehow. It's probably because the housekeeping genes, the ribosomal genes, RNAs in particular, are covered with proteins, and the proteins inhibit uh, random priming. Uh, I think that this is the, the, the level of non-coding we would expect to find. Certainly, microRNAs require a separate, because they're so small, they, that random priming does not serve them well. Um, but the other, the long ones, we should, should be normal. Uh, I, I can get back to you on that with more precision. Uh, yeah, I think That, that's my impression, uh, yeah. Can I ask you yeah. uh, one question and take you back to your first point, which yeah. was the haplotyping. Yes. So it's, it's been an issue for a long, long time. 
ever since we sequenced the genome to, to get a phased genome. Right. Yeah. And it's really important, as you pointed out. Yeah. Can you extrapolate from uh, the technology that we currently have yeah. how far that can be pushed and what other invention or really step up is still required to get a fully phased human genome? Because right. currently, I think if I just re remember correctly, it was about three Megabases is the yes. So this is the, this is this is three megabases. Yeah. That's from bacterial or yeah. chromosomes, which I don't recommend in general because it's expensive to make a back library. We wanted to make a back library because we we want to be able to have 150 KB pieces that we can insert with CRISPR. Yeah. So that this is a synthetic biology resource. It's PGP1 cell, uh, compatible. We know the sequence and we know the cells. Mm -hmm. So the next one down is the LFR method, which is more like 1.5 megabases for uh, African populations. And so it's, and it's something like 600 kilobases for Caucasian because of just the polymorphism rate. That's not great. Uh, it could be get better. But remember, this is done with these 384 well plates where you're lumping together 0.1 uh, X of the genome. 10% uh, of the genome is in each of those wells. We, 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 meaning uh, complete genomics, can now individually label each of the backs with a barcode, or not backs, each of the pieces of, of genomic DNA, which is not amplified, with a barcode, and now uh, that will get much longer. The best, of course, would be to have long reads uh, rather than uh, this assembly process, and I think that we'll see some long reads in the next year or two from a variety of new methods, in, you know, in, including nanopores. Um, brilliant talk. Your last slide showed a neuron, and in the neuron, um, messenger RNA is in the cell body, very little messenger RNA uh, goes down the neurite. Has the FIS, have you done FIS-seq to show that, or demonstrate there's a relationship no. between sequence and geographical distribution of RNA? Yeah, un unfortunately, we have, we've applied FIS-seq to uh, neural uh, it, it's one of our main objectives, but we don't yet have much data. Mo most of the data that we have that's publishable is on fibroblasts, but the brain is brain and neurons is our major focus for physique. We're doing, you know, it, it all, it's known from the literature that there's uh, asymmetry in those. In fact, there's asymmetry in a lot of cells, but it's just not, it's not studied because of the limitations of, fit, of fluorescent and C2 hybridization and <laughs> on the one hand, and RNA seq on the other. Yeah, right there. To what extent CRISPR and Cas9 efficacy depends on the local chromatin structure? Let's say if you target euchromatic and heterochromatic regions, do you see any difference? Right. We haven't done a systematic uh, comparison of euchromatic and heterochromatic, um, but. Like I say, everything that, that we and other groups, and now many other groups have tried, uh, it's, it, it works out. But we, we, should take, we should take the worst case scenarios and, and try them out. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any hand up. So thank you very much, thank George, you. for yeah. kicking us off with such an exciting talk.